Welcome. If people could please take their seats, we can get started. Good afternoon. My name is Cindy Arnson. I'm the director of the Latin American program here at the Woodrow Wilson Center. And it's a true pleasure to be joining with my colleagues from Harvard University and the Council of the Americas in the sponsorship of this important forum. I'd especially like to thank Marilee Grindle, the director of the David Rockefeller Center for Latin American Studies at Harvard, also a professor um, at the Kennedy School uh, at Harvard, as well as Eric Farnsworth, uh, vice president of the Council of the Americas, who um, I'm told is running a little late, but hopefully uh, will join us in just a few moments. What I'd like to do in opening um, this session is paint some aspects of a broader picture, um, a scenario that I think is well known um, to many, if not all of you. Um, for the most part, it is not pretty. For the five years beginning in 2004, Latin American economies on average grew about 5% annually. As a result, according to the United Nations Commission uh, for Latin America and the Caribbean, regional poverty rates fell from 44% in 2002 to 33% in 2008. Now the forecasts for growth in 2009 vary widely. The optimists, including the World Bank, predict that growth will fall to around 2% throughout the region in the coming year. Others, particularly in the private sector, predict contraction. High commodity prices for such products as oil, copper, soy, have fueled the region's economic expansion. Now commodity prices have collapsed. The demand for raw materials in industrial economies, and I would include China in that category, um, has fallen dramatically, translating to a decline in demand for Latin American exports. Remittances from workers living abroad in the United States and Europe have fallen as industrial economies sink deeper into recession. Capital is scarce, that which is available is expensive. Even though the state in many Latin American countries is stronger than it was in the 1980s and the 1990s, and countries such as Chile have prepared for the rainy day and accumulated significant reserves over the past years of booming commodity prices, governments may in fact be extremely limited in terms of their ability to cushion the effects of global economic crisis. Not surprisingly, groups with the lowest incomes are predicted to be the ones who will feel the most drastic effects in terms of rising unemployment, rising levels of informality, reduced safety nets, and rising inequality. Some of our panelists will no doubt take exception to this um, rather Cassandra-like um, portrait that I've just painted, um, and it's hardly the case that nothing is being done by governments, by the private sector, by civil society organizations, and international financial institutions to respond to the effects of the crisis. The participants in today's event represent for us an embarrassment of riches um, to help us deepen our understanding of the economic crisis in Latin America and its effects not only on well-being but indeed on the future of democratic governance. I have the pleasure of introducing our first speaker, World Bank Vice President for Latin America and the Caribbean region, Pamela Cox. You have with you um, the bios um, of all of the panelists, and so I'll just briefly summarize. Um, Pamela has held a number of senior leadership positions since joining the bank in 1980, with responsibility for Africa and Asia, as well as Latin America and the Caribbean region. She holds a PhD in development economics and policy from the Fletcher School at Tufts University, a master's degree in law and diplomacy, and a degree, a degree in international studies and international economics from Reed College. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, Pamela. I'd also like to say just a brief um, a word to those who are um, joining us in the overflow room. We had unprecedented and truly unexpected um, levels of interest in this forum. People who are watching um, either in the, in the dining room or down in the fourth floor con conference room will have an opportunity to submit questions in writing for the panelists. So even if you're not physically in this space, we very much want to take account of your interests. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, 
colleagues and friends of the Woodrow Wilson Center, ladies and gentlemen, uh, before I start my, my speech, I truly am delighted to see uh, a large number of people here today. Uh, Moises Naim, whom I'm sure most of you know, ha had coined the phrase about two years ago that Latin America is like Atlantis, the lost continent, because there seemed to be so little interest worldwide in what was going on in, in Latin America. But certainly, with the, with the uh, people attending today, uh, uh, that seems to have changed. Um, I would also like to thank the Woodrow Wilson Center, the David Rockefeller um, Center and the Council of the Americas for hosting this event today and especially for inviting me and giving me uh, an opportunity to talk a little bit about the critical issues that are affecting Latin America and its development uh, today. What I want to do today is to focus on how the global crisis is affecting the region, both through the real economy and the financial sector. I'm going to talk a little bit about the decoupling theory, which was so popular last year. For those of you who hadn't heard about it, the theory was is that Latin America is decoupled from the rest of the world and was going to sail through the crisis. Sadly, that's not the case. But I also want to talk about how the region can protect the social gains that it has achieved with the five years of very solid growth that we've seen. And indeed, also talk a little bit about how Latin America can prepare itself for recovery and, and future growth. I know that when we're in the depth uh, of this recession and, and in the depth of this unprecedented global crisis, it's a little bit difficult to think that we'll ever come out of it. But indeed, uh, we will. I think it's not news to anybody that we are, are in a, an economic crisis that the world has not seen in the lifetime of most economists alive today. Indeed, a, a crisis that, that we have not faced uh, since the 1930s. And I think if you read uh, the front pages of, of any newspaper every day, you'll also get a sense that, that um, the world and the economics profession doesn't really know how to respond to this crisis. We really don't know how much fiscal stimulus is going to be enough, either in the U.S. or in any other country. We really don't know what to do about toxic assets. And I think the only answer that, that's really coming out uh, seems to be we're going to rely on the state to intervene. And this is something, of course, that was entirely uh, unthinkable even uh, two years ago. Economists, of course, have looked back to uh, the recession in the 1980s. They've looked back to the recessions in the 1970s. They've looked back uh, even to the 1930s in terms of, of guidance. But the types of problems that are confronting us now throughout the world are very different, and it's not clear how we're going to emerge. Some people are saying, let's go back and look at the books. Other people are saying, let's throw the books away. So we need to remember this as we go into any discussion about Latin America or any other region, that it's going to be very, very difficult to have any prognosis, any set of policy recommendations, any new Washington consensus or, or Sao Paulo consensus. I, I'm telling you right now, if, if you came to, to get that from me, it doesn't exist. Now, certainly all the economies in the world uh, have been hit, and there have been dozens of governments that are coping with this crisis, hundreds of markets that are coping with this crisis, thousands of businesses that are coping with this crisis, but even more important, millions of hardworking people who are already affected by the crisis. Now, the good news is, is this time, the crisis did not erupt in the emerging economies. And Latin America in particular, this is good news. It seemed to be that every crisis we had in the 80s, in the 90s, the tequila crisis, uh, the crisis of 2001, Latin America started to get a bit of a reputation that it, it was crisis prone. And this time around, Latin America is not the epicenter of the crisis. The crisis has emerged uh, from the developing countries. It's emerged in particular uh, from the U.S. Uh, and then, of course, spread to Europe. But the region, nevertheless, is profoundly affected by the crisis. And it's already beginning to grapple with the contracting global demand, the declining exports, uh, the absolute fall off in commodity prices, and of course, the restricted access 
to finance uh, and to capital flows. And the crisis has brought to a screeching halt five years of sustained economic growth in Latin America. Latin America had not for many years seen such a golden age of growth. It's been around 5% a year, but it's been fueled in part by the adoption in Latin America of sensible macroeconomic policies, and in part it was fueled by the boom in commodity prices. Before the downturn, for the first time in 30 years, several countries in the region were able to make significant progress in reducing poverty and inequality. Brazil, Chile, Argentina, El Salvador, Colombia, amongst others, poverty reduction was achieved, in part due to the fiscal space that was provided by improved macroeconomic policy. And what this did was allow more intelligent social spending, focused on those who need it most, uh, budget surpluses, never before seen increases in international reserves, a more attractive investment environment, and lower inflation rates. Indeed, it seemed as if Latin America had finally taken off, just like the Asian tigers. And of course, those who know Latin America know that the region has not been immune to financial shocks. Latin America suffered severely from financial shocks in the 1970s, the 80s, the 90s, and during 2001, 2002. And people in the region know too well and too bitterly the shocks and the pain of losing their savings or assets. They know the shock of banks collapsing. They know the dramatic depreciation of local currencies and the resulting poverty, unemployment, and negative growth. But this time, Latin America was not hit in the same way as other economies, and it led to what we call the decoupling theory. If we go back to August 2007, which is when the subprime crisis actually erupted, to mid-2008, when commodity prices started to fall, there was a sense that the region would weather this global crisis relatively unscathed. After all, the global crisis was in the U.S., it was in Europe, it wasn't in Latin America. While it roiled these economies, the world outlook for Latin America and the Caribbean continued to, to look, at, while not maybe completely rosy, it didn't look bleak. Currencies were still strengthening. Central banks continued to accumulate reserves in this period. Levels of direct foreign investments were maintained. Portfolio capital inflows rose. Indeed, growth prospects for 2008 were revised upward, and Peru and Brazil joined the investment-grade club of countries. Things looked rosy indeed. And the reason behind the existence of this uh, relative oasis in the midst of, of crisis elsewhere was the boom in commodity prices. For those of you who remember, uh, what we were talking about uh, a year ago what were the inflationary impacts of food and fuel and, and the skyrocketing prices of oil, the skyrocketing prices uh, of food. Uh, you know, some economists even were very concerned that this was yet another bubble that, that uh, countries would have to uh, face. But indeed, the link between Latin American growth uh, and development and commodity prices uh, is very powerful. According to, to our statistics, about 90% of the region's population depend one way or another on commodity exports and about 95% of the region's GDP is based in part on commodity exports. And so by mid-2008, as commodity prices started a, a rapid tumble, the decoupling theory melted away. Commodity prices were moving adversely for Latin America, and this was reinforcing rather than offsetting the trends coming from the global slowdown and the financial turmoil. After Lehman Brothers filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy in, in September, a perfect storm took shape in the region. And the region was suddenly and screechingly brought into full synchronization with the rest of the world. This was recoupling with a vengeance. The impact was very clear. The region's stock markets fell sharply in September as investors' risk priorities changed. Currencies depreciated, 40% in Brazil, almost 30% in Chile. Commodity prices plunged and are now at January 2007 levels. That's a 50% decrease from the 2008 peak. 
Remittance flows contracted significantly with particularly significantly strong uh, effects in Mexico, Latin America, and the Caribbean. We've seen a 6% decline in the last quarter of 2008. Households, companies, and governments all started to feel the effects of the credit crunch. For example, what we found in Central America is Wachovia Bank provided more than 50% of all the trade financing. And when Covia Bank got into trouble, this posed huge problems for many Central American countries. At this point, nearly all countries in the region have felt the impacts of the crisis. But I want to stress that different countries in the region are feeling the impact of the crisis in different ways. Now, if, if we start from the top and sort of work our way down geographically, Mexico and Central America, whose economies are most closely tied and synchronized with that of the United States, risk suffering the most from a prolonged recession in the U.S. because their economic, their trade relations, uh, indeed the remittances they receive, are all very closely tied to the U.S. economy. Uh, Mexico at this point is projecting negative growth for 2009. In South America, however, the, exposure, the explosion of the commodity bubble is hitting Brazil very hard, Argentina, which was relying heavily on trade taxes to finance its budget, is also affected. Uh, although with the nationalization of the pension system, they, they found some extra cash. And uh, we've also seen Chile. <laughs> we'll comment about that later. We've also seen uh, uh, Chile, which, of course, had built up a, a very nice cushion with, with their anti-cyclical copper fund, also experiencing severe budget uh, problems. Oil exporting nations, such as Venezuela and Ecuador, need to adjust their, their uh, spending because their revenues are falling short. Oil prices, of course, have tumbled from a high of $160 a barrel to around $40 a barrel right now. Now, less affected are those countries that have managed to save during the good times. And uh, remember, I, I said that many countries in the region came into the crisis with much, in a much stronger position due to very good macroeconomic policies. And of course, those with more diversified markets, including Asia. These are countries such as Chile, Colombia, and Peru. But with demand falling off in, in Asia as well, uh, and China, of course, demanding fewer uh, commodity imports, uh, we're also going to see the, the crisis there. Overall, we've also seen that countries which have autonomous central banks with inflation targeting regimes and solid fiscal processes are the ones that have been better positioned uh, during this crisis. In September 2008, the consensus forecast for Latin America was 3.7 percent growth for 2009. By January 2009, last month, by contrast, the consensus forecast is da now down to an anemic 1 percent growth which is uh, aligned with the overall downward uh, revisions of, of worldwide growth. What a difference three months can make. Now, the current crisis has highlighted the need to regulate markets better. Certainly um, in the U.S. and certainly Latin America learned that lesson coming out of the various financial crises it, it used to have. But we also need to remember that, that some of the countries in the region will be better able to withstand this crisis because they have already implemented prudent macro and financial policies, including stronger financial sector re uh, regulation. Uh, unlike the past, Latin America faced this crisis with reserves in the bank, budget surpluses, lower external debt, uh, lower debt overall, better regulation overall. I'm going to contrast that with, with Eastern Europe, which did not go into the crisis that way. And of course, Eastern Europe is, is facing right now very severe effects through the financial sector. But nevertheless, policymakers are still going to face significant challenges managing the short-term problems of the crisis while also maintaining the conditions for long-term growth. I think this is a very important point that, that we at the World Bank want to stress. It's very important that the current financial and economic crisis not become a human and a social crisis. And therefore, it's very important that timely and decisive actions are taken to protect the social gains that the region has made. So what is our advice? What should governments do 
uh, in these circumstances. Now, I need to preface this with the fact that nobody really knows anything anymore about what anybody should do. But uh, looking at the lessons of, of experience, we do have some broad uh, uh, suggestions. First and foremost, um, the region needs to increase well-targeted support to the most vulnerable through social protection packages. This package should ensure broad access to health insurance services. It should protect public spending on key areas such as nutrition and vaccines and provide additional targeted cash support. Now, many of you may know that, that Latin America is, is famous throughout the world for the systems of conditional cash transfers uh, that uh, began in the region and, and have spread to other regions, such as in Brazil, uh, Bolsa Familia, in Mexico, Oportunidades, similar programs in El Salvador, Panama, Jamaica, uh, and Colombia. And these programs are now being expanded to mitigate some of the worst effects uh, of the economic slowdown. Indeed, in the World Bank, we've, we've targeted these programs as a way to quickly inject more capital uh, into uh, countries. And we hope to do at least $2 billion of additional lending just to social programs uh, in the region. But it's also important to remember that these conditional cash transfer programs were targeted primarily at very poor segments of the population. And right now, Latin America is going to have to cope with a lot more people being plunged uh, into poverty. So we need to go beyond these uh, conditional cash transfer programs to look at other aspects of social safety nets uh, to add to this. For example, things like nutrition programs, uh, keeping children in school, workfare types of programs. And, and that's additional work that these countries need to do because the conditional cash transfer programs will not be enough. Secondly, and this is primarily for these countries that, that have the, the fiscal space, the temporary financing of, emergency, of emerging deficits is crucial to avoid unduly cutting expenditures on things like social protection, on health, on education, on infrastructure. Uh, it is better at this point to run a budget deficit and have fiscal stimulus. I, I think you only need to look at the U.S. to, to realize that. Um, you know, where savings or, or prudent borrowing from multilaterals permit, well-designed increases in expenditure programs can be very important in a time of, of crisis. But these need to both close the gaps between human and physical capital, and they need to boost domestic uh, demand. We've already seen that multi-billion dollar uh, fiscal stimulus packages have been set in motion in Argentina, Brazil, Mexico, uh, and Chile with the objectives of investing in infrastructure, particularly infrastructure that creates a lot of jobs, uh, protecting jobs, uh, facilitating credit, and promoting consumer spending. Third area, governments can make a difference by moving very quickly towards active labor market policies through job creation me methods, such as public works programs, initiatives in the support of self-employment, and of course, uh, small and medium enterprises, microcredit, things like that. Together with retraining uh, and training programs for the unemployed and wage and employment subsidies, these measures will not only have a direct human effect, but will also contribute to the economic recovery. Fourth, the region really needs to keep strengthening policies aimed at longer-term development and growth and at the eventual recovery. Otherwise, the gains of the growth over the last five years will be lost. Countries that are better able to manage the dangers posed by the crisis, i.e. those who are not plunged into severe crisis themselves, can help seize the opportunity so they can position themselves to assume rapid growth and gain a larger presence in world markets. This, for example, means continued investments in some of the issues that have plagued Latin American growth, trade facilitation, trade infrastructure, quality of education, overall logistics, overall investment uh, in infrastructure. Fifth, most countries in Latin America are still committed to open trade. And the upcoming Summit of the Americas will be an excellent opportunity to reconcile regional interests with the common interests of expanding economic relations that are mutually beneficial for all countries in, in the Western Hemisphere. It's very important that trade stay open. 
One of the big lessons from the Depression in the U.S. is that when you introduce trade restrictions and trade wars, uh, overall global welfare quickly spirals downward. What happened in the U.S. is that, in fact, Europe started coming out of the Depression before the U.S. did. But because uh, of the, the retaliatory trade uh, measures uh, between regions, the U.S. was not able to export to Europe and then take advantage of, of growing faster and getting out of the Depression. And indeed, you know, what we see is that crises often present opportunities for governments uh, to deal with certain sacred cows that they couldn't have dealt with before simply because they're in the midst uh, of the crisis. And finally, uh, for governments in the region, the effectiveness of governments and in institutions itself in using the scarce resource as well will play a crucial role of weathering the storm. Let me give you one example of uh, something that's both efficient and something that's a sacred cow in the region. Many countries in Latin America uh, use universal subsidies uh, for various things. Universal subsidies mean subsidies that are large, they're untargeted, they go to the middle class, uh, they're very inefficient, and they crowd out the expenditures that need to be made on growth uh, inducing sorts of things like quality education, uh, investing in people, investing uh, in infrastructure. Uh, some areas are water and sanitation, education, gasoline, uh, electricity. These subsidies are, are a huge drag. And in fact, when you contrast Latin America with, say, Asia, Asia in the past has not used large subsidies and therefore usually had much more room in their uh, budgets to invest in, in education and infrastructure, which is why Asia grew faster and competed better than Latin America. With a political will, and the crisis may help on focusing people's attention on this, an overhaul of this free-for-all subsidy system could result in substantial savings that then could be used for targeted safety net programs and economic stimulus. The region annually spends between 5 to 10 percent of GDP on subsidies. That is a huge amount. Approximately one-third of this amount is captured by the top income, earning 20 percent of the population. And this would be enough to triple or more direct transfer programs to the poorer segments of the population. Just a few numbers to keep in mind. Now, we also have to re re uh, remember that in 2009, Latin America is also going to start to move into uh, another uh, election cycle. We're going to see in 2009 presidential elections in Panama, El Salvador, Chile, Uruguay, Ecuador, Bolivia, and legislative contests in Argentina and Mexico. Uh, Bolivia is reforming its constitution after President Morales recently won the referendum, and in two weeks, Venezuelans will decide if presidential term limits will be abolished or not. And it is precisely during this crisis and in, defi in these defining political junctures that leadership in maintaining sound economic management combined with an emphasis on protecting recent social gains will be needed to cushion the shock and facilitate the resumption of growth once the storm has passed. One of the great things about Latin America is, is that people can vote, and they vo vote noisily and often, and they participate in democracy. But when you have highly unequal societies, as you see in, in many, if not all, Latin American countries, it is also true that, that an external shock will inject uh, a lot of tension into the, the political and economic system unless, in fact, uh, governments are paying attention to policies that will ensure gains uh, for all, or at least protection, during the crisis. I also want to emphasize that, of course, a global economic crisis demands global solutions. And while we must recognize that, that there will be no solution to this worldwide economic crisis, if the point of view and the concerns of the developing countries are not taken into account. There's a G20 process, as everyone knows, that's going on, a process which wants to expand uh, the voice, in, in particular, of the emerging countries. And they've agreed that the uh, developing economies, such as Mexico and Brazil in particular, should now have a seat at the table, together with developed countries, as part of the solution to some of these global problems, as, as those of 
many of you may know, leading up to the G20 meetings, there are working groups working on, on such things as financial sector uh, regulation and, and uh, sort of the world financial order. And it's very important at this time that this not be a world financial order that's decided by seven or eight countries, but indeed is, is one decided by the major economies uh, of the world. We at the World Bank certainly uh, support this path, and, and we very much welcome these steps towards uh, new multilateralism. And indeed, I'd like to, to quote from uh, our president, Robert Zellick, who said, responsible globalization with inclusivity and sustainability should take precedence over the enrichment of a few. And I think we need to remember this as, as we go through the crisis. We need a global solutions, multilateral solutions that ensure that all countries benefit. And I'd just like to, to talk a little bit about what the World Bank in particular is doing during this unprecedented um, crisis. Uh, we're increasing lending throughout the world, uh, including lending for middle income countries. Uh, in the next three years, we will commit uh, $100 billion worldwide uh, in grants, uh, including grants and concessional lending for low-income nations, and loans for the private sector through IFC will be an additional to that $100 billion. Uh, through IBRD, we have more than doubled our lending to Latin America to some $13 billion this year. And these additional resources uh, are very critical to protecting jobs, for social gains, uh, going through ongoing public sector programs, and of course, injecting liquidity into countries. I just want to, to conclude with, with a few key messages. To get through this crisis, responsible leadership is crucial. Certainly responsible leadership uh, on the part of the US and of Europe but also responsible leadership uh, amongst the emerging uh, countries as well. It's very important as we go forward that Latin America not be the lost continent, but actually be part of the global solutions. As the, the world stage is reshuffled and the chairs are reshuffled and we're thinking about the new world economic order, it's very fair that we have a global system that, that has more people uh, at the table. But I'm confident in the region that as we lean into this crisis with the robust growth and the social progress uh, that we've had, that Latin America indeed will be better placed to weather this crisis than any crisis it's had in the past. Thank you. Great. We have some time for questions. Um, please wait for the microphone. And uh, if you would all do us the courtesy of um, introducing yourself and, and telling us uh, the institution with which you're affiliated. Um, I see a hand over here. Yes. Thank you for an excellent presentation. Maria Veles with Latin Intelligence Corporation. You are talking of trade, with the U.S. being the major market for all of the Latin American countries, and the Obama policy of buying America. How is that going to influence the process that you suggest? Okay. Do we have another, another hand? Sure, Sandy. Wait one second. Wait, wait for Nikki. Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, that was very interesting what you gave. I used to be at the World Bank too, and I'm now at uh, at Georgetown University. The question I have, though, is one of the things that we know about poverty in Latin America. It's very much related to race and ethnicity, the indigenous people and the Afro descendants. And with a person like Obama now as president, do we have the possibility of raising the notion that we could deal with with poverty through uh, global support because of race and ethnicity, especially because we voted against the UN declaration previously on indigenous rights. Should we now promote it in order to ensure that race and ethnicity are taken into account in our, in our help for Latin America? Sandy, if you want to just mention your name before you give back the mic. 
Yeah, my name is Shelton Davis. From I, I, I used to be at the World Bank in the Latin America region. I'm now at the uh, Center for Latin American Studies at Georgetown University. But I'm very interested in the, the question because we, even when we did poverty at the early part of the 20th, uh, the new century, we looked at race and ethnicity as very important in Latin America. Great. Okay, let's take one last question in this group. This one. Uh, David Brooks of La Jornada newspaper. Uh, we were told over the last 15, 20 years, especially with the Washington Consensus in Latin America, that that was the road to prosperity, stability. Um, and now we are in this crisis that you just described. Uh, what do you think are two or three elements of that need to be part of whatever the next consensus is? It goes automatically on. Um, there was a comment um, on trade and the Obama, po whoops, sorry, Obama policy um, of of buy America. Uh, first of all, most of Latin American exports do not go to the U.S. Okay, there's very different patterns. Uh, certainly, Mexico, Central America, very tied to the U.S. Most of South America, much more diversified um, markets. Um, I would like to say, in general, um, and and stress again. Uh, we know from bitter experience that closing trade is not a good thing, even in a crisis. We've seen it in the 1930s bitterly in the U.S. I mean, every economic study you see says that closing trade reduces economic welfare for everybody. And um, while we do not opine on, on U.S. policies, you know, I, I hope in, in the debate that this point will, will be brought out, that at the end of the day it's not good for the U.S. and it's not good for anybody else. That's, that's the World Bank position. Um, Sandy, you, you rightly have, have underlined the importance of, of race and ethnicity uh, as a determinant of, of poverty um, in Latin America. Um, I, I'm certainly hoping that the election of a president like Obama g gives a lot of, of hope uh, to a lot of people around the world. I would like to talk a little bit about um, a new indicator that we've worked on in, in the region, uh, and we issued a report on it, I think, two months ago, called the Human Opportunity Index. Uh, a lot of times when we look at poverty, we, we look at a static thing. We look at people who are already in poverty, and we look at their determinants. Using the Human Opportunity Index, uh, and based on, on a lot of data from a lot of countries in, in the world, this determines who has opportunities at birth. And we, we looked in particular uh, at four things, um, access to education, um, access to water, access to health, and access to electricity. And one of the things that, that we found is that, that the two, two of the greatest determinants to whether you will end up poor in Latin America are your father's income and your mother's education. And using this index, planners can actually target areas where investments in these four areas will have huge gains for reducing poverty in the future. Uh, it's online on our website. You can get copies of it. I highly recommend it. It's a very, very innovative and interesting um, study. Somebody um, asked um, from La Jornada asked about um, the Washington Consensus and um, you know the road to prosperity in the future. Uh, I'd like to reiterate again. It's because the countries in the region put in place the sound macroeconomic policies over the last five years these policies that have broadly been called the Washington Consensus, it is because of that that they were not hit with the shock immediately. They are much better placed than countries that have not done this. And I think you can look around the world, and, and I think what you see in Eastern Europe is a very different situation. So the lesson should be following sound macroeconomic policies is a good thing. It allows you to grow. It, you, you reduce poverty and inequality and it helps you weather crises um, better. Looking ahead uh, as to you know, what countries are going to need to do to prosper in the future once they get through the crisis, um, I think we, we still have 
the Latin America growth agenda there. First and foremost, once they get out of the crisis, and even while they're in the crisis, people should try to avoid doing silly things, uh, especially on the macroeconomic side. Subsidies, for example. I mentioned universal subsidies. If you can target them, subsidies are not a bad thing. If you give subsidies to everybody, it's very costly and doesn't have the impact you want. But we, we know that Latin America had some critical uh, issues that around growth. One was the quality of education. Clearly, investment in human capital is going to be important. In a crisis, investment in nutrition is absolutely important. Okay, if you have poor nutrition in the first two years uh, of life, that's something that is irreversible. You, you will never recover from it. So focusing on nutrition, focusing on human capital, important. Secondly, as you look at fiscal packages and stimulus, why not invest in smart ways on infrastructure? And this includes not only infrastructure that could facilitate trade in the future, but also the green agenda. Okay? Latin America is leading on the climate change agenda. Indeed, we're working with Mexico on an urban uh, transport project, which is going to be one of the first projects benefiting from these new climate change funds, which will both introduce efficiency uh, and create jobs and help poor people with better transportation. Okay, those are the smart types of smart things people can do going forward. Other questions? This woman here? Max, you want to? Thanks. Hi, my name is Susan Manushkin. You didn't mention much about investment flows to Latin America. Now, we know that they're suffering, as they do in any financial crisis, but what does the bank foresee for the next year, uh, the conditions for different kinds of financial flows, whether it be aid, portfolio capital, direct, direct investment? Um, should the countries expect that to come to a halt? It will be varied uh, between countries. Just your projections for that. Sure. Oh, thank you. Uh, Richard Downey from the Center for Hemispheric Defense Studies. And a great presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, during your response to so that first round of questions, you mentioned the importance of free trade. And I guess it was a response to the, cons the Washington consensus question. Um, in the recent Davos talks, the U.S. in particular, and free trade in general, got beat up pretty badly. I wonder if, uh, if you've noticed an impact uh, in the region as a result of that, or perhaps even a defense of free trade in, in response to that, uh, that round of the U.S. and free trade getting beat up at Davos. Thank you. All the way in the back over there. Thank you for your presentation. Um, you outlined a couple of things which you said were guidance that you would um, give to countries. I'm just wondering, the bank itself and your portfolio, how are you adjusting your lending or your country assistance strategies to reflect the financial crisis? Could you Thank introduce you. yourself, please? Oh, I'm sorry. Elisa Wong. I'm with the State Department. Thanks. Pamela. OK. Um, the first question was um, around investment flows, whether they be aid, direct investment, and um, portfolio investment. Well, on the aid side, of course, Latin America doesn't get much of what we call traditional aid anymore. Um, Latin America is a heavy user of, of the, bi, you know, the IFIs, uh, but very few bilateral aid programs anymore. So certainly both we uh, and the IDB uh, and the Caribbean Development Bank and CAF and, and all the, the IFIs in the region are doing our utmost, okay? But we're fairly small in terms of, of overall flows. In terms of, of direct um, investment, uh, I, I'm just going to paraphrase what my chief economist was saying today. I think you're, you're hearing or seeing a great sucking up of the world's capital um, by the U.S. And, and, and I'm not saying it's being done intentionally. What I'm saying is, is that um, 
right now there, there's a flight back into the dollar because countries are, are looking around the world and saying, you know, where is going to be the, the safe haven? And if you have an investment you can make that's backed up by the U.S. government, that may look a lot better than an investment in another country that's not backed up by any government. And, and so right now, the, the whole issue of, of um, uh, portfolio investment, direct investment, it, it's being skewed, I, I think, because uh, of the crisis. Certainly, we're seeing a big fall off in Latin America. We're also seeing a big fall off in, um, of course, trade lines of credit. What we've seen uh, with international banks in the region is, as the banking crisis hit in the U.S. or in Spain or in Europe, is, of course, they started calling back uh, a lot of capital. And what we're seeing with local and domestic banks in the region is they're tending now to go towards um, the larger companies, probably less towards the SMEs. Okay? So we're seeing a rejigging of the credit. Credit is very scarce. People are going you know, in, into safety. And I think that's a very big concern um, for the recovery, is where are these lines of credit going to come from? Countries which have national development banks, and I think Brazil is, is doing this with Bandiesi, are aggressively using their national uh, development banks to, to put, inject money uh, into the economy, but not all countries uh, have this. So this is a big concern um, going forward. Um, in the point of free trade, I don't know if, if, you, if you saw the readouts from the World Social Forum in, in Belen, which was uh, around the uh, sort of I told you so uh, type of, of response. Um, I think many countries in the region recognize that if half your growth comes from commodity exports, you better believe in trade. And I think that that's a difference, though. That, that is a difference for Latin America from 20 years ago. Okay, uh, and I, when I say trade, I, I don't mean free trade. Absolutely unregulated open trade. We we need regulations around trade. We need to think about it, its impacts. But indeed, uh, many countries in the region have grown because they trade, and I think that point ha has been brought home to them. So a contraction with people start circling their wagons on the trade side is going to be very bad news for Latin America. You know, as I, I said, over ninety. Uh, percent of the GDP and 95 percent of the people in Latin America depend on, on commodity exports. And um, so I haven't seen a, a reversal of that yet, but what we don't want is a trade war to start in the world. I, I think nobody wants to, to see that. Um, there's a question how we're adjusting lending and, and our country assistance um, strategies. Um, as I mentioned, um, normally we lend about $5 billion a year to Latin America. This year we're lending $13 billion. Um, we're helping countries both with investment lending and fast dispersing lending. We hope to put between 2 and $3 billion of that into social protection programs. We, we know these pro programs very well. We've worked with them. Um, we also want to make sure that, that countries are maintaining um, their critical investments, so a lot of our money is going uh, into budget support programs, but not entirely. And we're also working with countries to figure out, you know, how do we do fiscal stimulus packages, particularly uh, we want to look at workfare, we want to look at infrastructure uh, investment as well, so that we can do more employment uh, generation. I think we have time for maybe two last questions. Let's take this gentleman and all the way in the back. Sure. Are you okay? Yeah. Thanks. My name is Ricardo Dominguez. I'm from the Organization of American States. I have a question regarding state capacity. You were talking about the differences in between the 90s and now, the Washington Consensus era and now. And we were talking mainly about policies, but the Washington Consensus was not only related with sounding policies, but also with state restructuring. And the state restructuring during the 90s mainly implies the dismantling of all or the kind nation tools. So now we are talking from a different perspective of coming back to this kind of state. Are, what do you think about it? Uh, do you think that the states down in Latin America are, are able now to cope with the new um, challenges in, term, in terms of state capacities? 
or are we again facing a problem of state restructuring? Nikki, right there in the back. Yeah, uh, thank you. Roberto Jimenez, a consultant. Two questions. How is the financial products of the bank, the contracyclical lending that was designed uh, to lend countries, especially in the crisis, are behaving now? Uh, you mentioned that you have some rapid disbursement, but I'm curious about how the cash flow looks vis-a-vis uh, -vis the borrowing countries and the World Bank now. And number two. Uh, Mexico, Central America, the two most affected countries with the U.S. economy. Mexico, Citibank has lost uh, heavily. Uh, El Salvador, 90% in foreign banks. How are the foreign banks behaving? Is the World Bank lending to those countries and those countries f putting credit for foreign banks to suck up all the follows back to the headquarters? Are you looking anything there about this rapid disbursement? Otherwise, we are just recycling dollars back to the banking system into the headquarters in New York. Is that okay? Um, let me um, respond to, to the question of the Washington consensus. I, I would disagree that the Washington consensus dismantled state capacity. That was not what the Washington consensus was about. The Washington consensus was about having sound macroeconomic policies and having governments that work. Um, there is going to be a big debate now in the world about the role of the state. And I think the question, though, going forward, is it a temporary role of the state or have we shifted completely the role of the state? Uh, there's a lot of history on it. I mean, we, we look to Eastern Europe and the role of the state in, in Russia and the Eastern European countries in the past, and did that lead to high growth and, and development? What were the impacts of that? I'll let you look at their previous growth rates, and you can determine whether it was a good or a bad. Um, I think as we go into this crisis, this is completely uncharted territory in terms of role of the state, and I think people are going to be saying, what is the right balance? What is efficient and not efficient? I'm speaking not as a political scientist, but I'm speaking as an economist. You want a state that, that's efficient and does what it's supposed to do and delivers the services it's supposed to do. Unfortunately, in many Latin American countries, many governments are not necessarily efficient. Many do not deliver services, especially to poor people. Many have universal subsidies. So we are going to enter a, a big debate. And I see the next two or three years with, with a lot of academics and practitioners and everybody else saying, well, should we have national development banks again? Countries that have them seem to, they seem to be a good tool right now. I'm ag you know, we're agnostic on it, but you're right. We're going to, to re-enter um, this debate. So I don't think there's a final word uh, on that particular issue. Um, in terms of the counter-cyclical um, lending that we do, I have to remind people that, you know, $13 billion is pretty small in, in terms of the overall GDP of Latin America, which is, you know, a couple trillion dollars. Um, and, and we're really not designed uh, to, to play the role that the, we might have played 20 years ago, because the economies are, are much, much bigger. But what we do try to do is work with others as part of packages. And in particular, when we lend money, I want to emphasize it goes to government budgets. It goes to the fiscal side. We are not lending money to private banks in the region, not through the World Bank arm. IFC does have banking colleagues, but IFC is a private sector arm. So our money is not going into government uh, budgets and then being given to uh, foreign banks. In fact, most countries in Latin America are not facing a severe financial sector crisis right now. They are not bailing out banks. Okay, there are some weaknesses here and there. There are some banks, but governments are not doing what's happening in Eastern Europe and happening in the U.S. and happening in Europe. They're not pouring money into banks. This is, this is a very different crisis than before. And I think we, we need to underline the point throughout the world that this crisis is being played out in different regions differently. In Latin America, the crisis is entering through the real sector. Okay? It's not as much through the financial sector as in previous crises. That means that the tools to deal with this crisis have to be tools that are around real sector types of tools. 
fiscal stimulus, creating employment, um, making sure that you can trade, things like that. It is not about bailing out banks. I'm not to, I, I can't predict I, if banks are going to fail or not uh, in Latin America, but right now that is where the crisis um, is entering. So I, I think you can be reassured that the money that's flowing in from the IFIs is not being recycled through foreign banks back to the U.S. Final word, Pamela, from you. No, I, I think I think the final word is is what I just said. That you know, this is a very different crisis than we've seen before, both in the world and and in in Latin America. But I think going ahead, we feel that Latin America is much better placed uh, than it was in the previous crises in the 70s, the 80s, and the 90s, uh, to weather this crisis. But indeed, Latin America is being hit. Please join me in thanking Pamela Cox from World Bank. Without taking a break, I'd like to invite Eric Farnsworth of the Council of the Americas um, and our second, the members of our second panel to change places. Yeah, well, that's right. Hey, Rebecca is here. Uh, no, no. Uh, oops, did I do that? I'm already being kicked off the stage. Well, I both want to uh, thank Pam Cox for her terrific comments and also suggest that I'm actually not very happy by her comments because she set such a high bar it's going to be virtually impossible to meet. But the fact of the matter is she gave, I think, a magnificent overview of the hemisphere and the financial conditions and some of the issues that are facing the region, facing the United States, facing the people of the Western Hemisphere. This afternoon in this panel, we have an opportunity to discuss some of these issues in greater depth. And we've got, I think, uh, one of the finest panels on some of these issues that, frankly, we could have had the honor to put together. So uh, my role today is simply to get us going, because these are the smart people over here, and we want to hear actually from them. But welcome, everyone, again to the program. I'm Eric Farnsworth with the America Society Council of the Americas. And uh, it's a real privilege to have the opportunity, as I mentioned, to moderate this very impressive panel. I think this is a timely and very important program. In fact, I have to compliment the foresight of the Rockefeller Center at Harvard, which actually proposed this program several months ago. And the foresight that they had in proposing this, I think, was remarkable. Frankly, I'm going to ask them to start picking some of my stocks, because uh, <laughs> if they got this right, they hopefully would be able to get the stock picking right, too. But in any event, um, the timing of this program, I think, is quite good. Let me add my thanks uh, to the David Rockefeller Center, to Mary Lee, and to Veronica, and to their entire team. And let me also thank, of course, Cindy Arnson and the Woodrow Wilson Center for hosting and playing such a vital role, of course, today. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a very important time in hemispheric affairs. A spirit of goodwill and cooperation, I think, exists uh, in the region. 
and uh, of course expectations are very, very high, and those expectations have to be managed. But the fact of the matter, now is the time, I think, to take concrete steps to build the region. And let me make one very brief point that supports what Pam Cox just said before I actually introduce the panel, and that point is this. There's a very open question in terms of what, would the, what could the United States do at this point in time to best help the region, in my view, the most obvious point must not be overlooked. The best way to assist the hemisphere is to fix the U.S. economy first, resisting any understandable but ultimately self-defeating efforts toward trade and investment protectionism. If the current economic crisis has proven anything, it's that Latin America remains dependent on the United States for its well-being, both directly through trade and investment flows and indirectly through the commodities trade. And again, we heard Pam talk a lot about that. Regardless of politics or ideology, the region remains hungry for trade and investment with the United States. Were we to do nothing else, restoring the U.S. economy while doing everything possible to keep markets open and investments flowing would do the most, in my view, to return much of Latin America to pre-crisis growth. Of course, there is much additional work to do, and we have the opportunity this afternoon to hear from three of the very top experts in the field. You have their biographic information in front of you and with you, so I won't go deeply into their backgrounds. Suffice it to say that Arturo Porsakansky has had a long and distinguished career in Latin American banking and finance, and he's now putting his three decades of experience to work in teaching, research, and consulting on exactly the issues that we're talking about today. Our second panelist is Rebecca Greenspan, who has devoted her entire career to development issues in government, academia, international institutions, and the nonprofit sector. Few are as knowledgeable or experienced in, experienced in these issues as she is, and it truly is a delight to welcome her to the panel as well. And finally, we have Jorge Dominguez, a giant in the field of Latin American studies, not just in the United States, but around the world. Jorge has written and edited more books than, more pe than some people have actually read, and he, <laughs> and he continues to lead the field in numerous ways. So Jorge, it's a pleasure to have you with us as well. As I promised, my remarks are to be limited. We want to hear from the panelists, so let's get right to it. Uh, let's go in the order in which I introduced. So that leaves uh, Arturo Porsakansky as our first panelist. I've asked each of them to make some brief opening comments to be followed by a uh, conversation that we hope to generate among the panelists. And then at the appropriate time, we'll open it up to the uh, floor for some questions and some answers. So Arturo, over to you. Thank you, Eric. Thank you very much for the invitation. And uh, by the time I left uh, Wall Street, it was a standard procedure that uh, you would disclose whether you had any financial interest in whatever you were going to talk about. But now in Washington, and uh, given the time, let me say this disclosure, I have paid my taxes. <laughs> so um, with, with that out of the way, uh, let, me, uh, let me talk about Latin America. Uh, first of all, uh, I would say uh, let's focus on the good news. I think a little bit after what uh, Pamela Cox has spoken, we need some good news, and I think there are some good news. Uh, first of all, Latin America is not in the newspaper headlines. Uh, I think that's great news. We don't have any uh, food riots to report. We don't have any bloody demonstrations. We're not toppling governments. So uh, I think you know, that's something remarkable because certainly whether uh, you read about uh, Iceland or, or the Baltics or Eastern Europe or, or so on, you know, there, there's been plenty of, uh, of headlines. So uh, if there is a problem, and there certainly are problems in the making, I mean, at least we're not at that stage uh, already. So they may come, but we're not at that stage. We're not getting the bad publicity ahead of the bad facts, at least. Uh, secondly, um, there are uh, no governments uh, lining up at 19th Street with their hats out uh, begging for money at the IMF. That's quite remarkable. The governments that have been lining up and have been getting or are negotiating uh, emergency financial assistance from the IMF uh, mostly come from uh, Western and Eastern Europe. That's also a remarkable fact because in prior crises at this stage there was a long line uh, at the IMF. Every uh, a, a rule has an exception. El Salvador ha has signed up, as you, some of you might know, for a precautionary arrangement. They hope not to draw. They have not drawn on it. It's just there. It's very understandable because, of course, El Salvador is fully dollarized. They don't have a lender of last resort capacity in-house, so they must get either the IMF or the Fed to back them up just in case uh, things go uh, horribly wrong, but they haven't. It's purely precautionary. There may be some other governments coming along, but you know, considering where we are, uh, say, uh, the surprise is that 
Uh, no, no line uh, at, the, at, at the door of the IMF. Um, uh, look at the credit rating agencies, much maligned, but anyway, they still serve an important function. They have been busy downgrading governments in Western Europe and in Eastern Europe, not a single downgrade in Latin America. Uh, every rule has an exception. Yes, Ecuador, after it defaulted, not because it didn't have the money to pay, but because it didn't have the willingness to pay, uh, was the duly uh, downgraded to a default status. But in general, there have been no um, uh, credit rating uh, downgrades in, in the large or, or the medium or even the smaller countries. There are some weak links. I expect some downgrades, but, you know, so far so good. Uh, fourth is, while uh, the credit crunch is here, and certainly the, the channels of, of finance have been disrupted, we've had uh, some large bond issues uh, in recent weeks. Uh, whether by governments like uh, those of Brazil, Colombia, or Mexico, whether by some of the premier companies in the region like Pemex and Petrobras, and even within local bond markets, a number of governments have been able to refinance their debt voluntarily, uh, extending maturities and so on. So uh, there is a sudden stop in capital, but uh, it, it, it's not as absolute as in, on prior occasions. And finally, inflationary pressures are abating. Uh, w w hidden as part of the boom of the last few years in Latin America is the fact that higher uh, energy and food prices in particular were crushing the poor, uh, certainly in Central America and the Caribbean, but also in other uh, poor countries and in other more uh, middle-income countries, certainly the poor were suffering. The gains on income distribution uh, had uh, previously obtained had been lost uh, to some extent in 06, 07, and the first half of 08. So inflation is coming down, interest rates are coming down, central banks can be supportive for a change, and uh, I expect that uh, uh, you know this is also a source of good news, especially for the poorest of the poor. Now uh, we come to the bad news. Okay, there are bad news. Uh, bad news is that certainly the data available for November, December, and what's coming out in January show that you know economic activity is collapsing in a number of countries. Uh, uh, so the recessions are here in many places. The question is how long, how deep, and so on, uh, as in the case of the United States. But uh, it took a while. Took a while, but uh, now clearly uh, there is there are recessionary forces in place. I would divide the region in three groups, uh, not very politically correct groups, but in three groups. Uh, one is uh, clearly, as was mentioned, Mexico, Central America, and the Caribbean. They depend on the United States and on Europe and so on in three ways: um, uh, exports of goods and services; those are down. Uh, workers' remittances from uh, their uh, expatriates in, in Spain and in the U.S. and so on, and those are down, and even some of those people are coming home, uh, and also tourism revenues. Um, and hopefully the weather will uh, hold up, uh, and so uh, some people will be, still be able to escape uh, to the Caribbean for the winter, but for what remains for the winter, but, but uh, definitely, you know, tourist uh, dollars are, are now uh, becoming scarce again. So that, I would say, is the front line. In many of those countries, they'll be lucky to avoid a negative number next to their GDP uh, in 2009. Uh, then comes what I would call the irresponsible left. We're talking about uh, Nicaragua, Venezuela, uh, Ecuador, Bolivia, Argentina. These governments uh, spent most of the bonanza. Uh, now they don't have a cushion uh, to fall back on, or not a very deep one. They don't have a good entries into the capital markets. They don't have good relations with foreign investors. Uh, so uh, I think many of them are going to regret it. And unless commodity prices bounce back, uh, let's say in 2010 or so on, uh, I expect we're going to see some of these governments under tremendous financial and other pressure. Uh, they made a lot of promises, they spent a lot of cash, and they're not going to be able to keep them. And uh, so uh, I think uh, watch that space. And then, uh, finally, I think the least affected uh, countries and the best able, the best positioned to survive this crisis are what I would call the responsible left uh, and the right. Um, so we're talking about Colombia, Peru, uh, Chile, Uruguay, Brazil, 
uh, and some governments in Central America and the Caribbean, certainly, uh, they uh, did not spend all the windfall. They saved some money. Of course, Chile does it better than anybody, but anyway. Uh, uh, but uh, in general, you have uh, more credible central banks. You have more flexible exchange rate regimes. You have better uh, liability management on the part of governments. You have more ability to uh, uh, apply a countercyclical uh, fiscal and monetary policies. I think that will show. And of those, uh, the best ones, I, I think the best performers will be in Peru. Uh, and of the previous group, I think uh, of the uh, of the populist left, let's say the responsible left, I think uh, Ecuador could end up uh, like Argentina did in 2002, if they don't watch it. And I think of the first group, there are some weak links, uh, Jamaica and so on, in the Caribbean, Central American area that, that are. And uh, to conclude, the other, of course, bad news is the credit channel, which has been disrupted. But within that, there is also good news. Uh, most governments have used the bonanza years to stretch out the maturities of their debt, to issue more local currency denominated debt, namely uh, to reduce maturity mismatches and to reduce currency mismatches. Uh, incidentally, in Eastern Europe, uh, they did the opposite. So now they're going through a 1990s type Latin American Asian slash uh, problem. Uh, the, I, the banks, it was mentioned, uh, foreign, uh, the banking systems in most Latin American countries are very well anchored by uh, foreign banks. And uh, in that sense, Latin America got lucky because the foreign banks that are anchoring the Latin American banking systems for the most part are the ones that have not had major losses. We're talking about the two largest Spanish banks. We're talking about the likes of HSBC and so on. So I think in that sense, uh, ter things turned out well. The problem is the corporates. Uh, I think there are, uh, as you know, a growing number of Latin, Amer Latin American multinational corporations, and they thought they knew how to play the game in terms of currency management and liability management and so on, and, and several of them got their fingers burned. We already know their names, Ara Cruz in, in, in Brazil, say, or, or some of the Mexican major multinationals. Uh, it's not the end of the world, but I think that uh, when it comes, I think this a financial crisis will mostly affect the private sector, and in particular the non-banking private sector in Latin America, rather than the banking systems or governments. I'll stop there. It's a lot to chew on that you've given us. Thank you very much. Uh, Rebecca, Dr. Greenspan. Yeah, uh, first of all, thank you very much to the Woodrow Wilson Center and the Rockefeller Center for inviting me and, and be part of this uh, wonderful panel. Uh, let me just start by saying that uh, despite all the good news, the truth is that the per capita income in Latin America will decrease in 2009, and will decrease in most countries of the region, and probably in the average of the region. It's not only the absolute number of growth, but the per capita income, uh, the per capita GDP. And per capita GDP will go down. Uh, and uh, the optimists now say that we will grow 1% in average, uh, many of the others are saying no more than a half percentage point growth in, in the region for 2009. Second, although it is true and we have said that and the, the region is better shaped today than in the 80s, uh, there is something here that, we, you know, a saying in Spanish that is, yes, you are right, but you're going to jail, you know? <laughs> and something like that is happening in Latin America, okay? We are better prepared, we have done our job, we have been responsible, you know, at large in the macroeconomic arena, and we will suffer heavily, and we will suffer heavily, and we will suffer heavily in the social, uh, uh, in the social sphere, and we have to think very careful how, if we will suffer also in the democratic governance uh, uh, arena too. The sever severity of the impact will depend on how long the crisis will last, because very soon we will get rid of all our instruments <laughs> that we have accumulated only in the last five or six years. We, we didn't have like 20 years of accumulation of, you know, of growth. We had only five, six years. So very soon, countries will run off of the benefits of having grow, uh, grow, uh, uh, a high uh, growth of rate uh, in the last six years. So how long the the crisis will last, uh, is important. How will the government behave? I, I totally agree with that. Uh, not only in terms of uh, economic responsibility, but also in terms of social responsibility. And also how will the international community respond 
to Latin America. Uh, as uh, it has already been said, all engines of growth are affected, all of them. <laughs> so we, we don't have very much to grab to, okay? Uh, exports are going down, tourism, and I am very glad you, you mentioned that, remittances, and also uh, all the, uh, the financing, you know, the, the foreign investment and the corporate credit that was mentioned. Uh, our problem now is not public indebtedness, but corporate indebtedness in uh, the region. Uh, uh, we are better prepared. Let me give you only two, two examples of the, of the effort of the region. You know, in, in 81, we had 8% of deficit of GDP in average in the region. Now we have a surplus of more than 3%. Uh, in terms of, the, of public uh, external debt, we had a, a, an external debt of 45% of GDP in average in Latin America in the 80s. Now we have less than 25%. So it's true that we have, we have done a lot of work. And in terms of the social programs, it was mentioned by Pamela, 85 million Latin Americans are receiving subsidies under the, the conditional cash transfer. So we are not talking about a small program. It's 85 million people that is already under those programs in, in Latin America. Nevertheless, important weaknesses remain, as, as I said before. First, the region continues to be heavily dependent on commodity export, and by and large, the region is perhaps as dependent of the external se sector as it was 25 years ago. So the whole issue of div div diversification of the productive structure remains a challenge for Latin America still. Second, inequality and poverty remains very, very high. It's true that it has gone down, but let me give you this figure. Latin America uh, uh, got the same rate of poverty it has before the crisis of the 80s only in 2005. For 25 years, we had higher rates of poverty in Latin America. So it's only in 2005 that poverty went down below the, uh, the, 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 the rates of poverty we had before the crisis of the 80s. It took 25 years to Latin America to recover from the crisis of the 80s. And this is because... Let me, let me say this, that is more controversial, that uh, uh, we have not transitioned from a program-based uh, logic, uh, uh, program logic to an integrated view of social protection. Social security schemes and social protection, protection are still with low coverage in the region. They suffer segmentation, and they, ha they have inadequate benefit for large, se large, large sectors of the population. And here, I have a question for you, because we all agree that we have to protect the poor in this crisis. But one thing we, we, cannot, we have to reflect on is that you cannot have a state that works only for the poor, because the ones that pay the taxes also want services. You know, the middle classes of Latin America that also pays, pay taxes, they want services, and they want to be protected, and they are suffering. And they are ma more, much more vulnerable today than they were before. And there are a lot of scholars here uh, that they have done this work in the past where you have to know that the distribution of, of income in Latin America, you have a large population around the poverty line. So the poverty line doesn't say everything in Latin America. There are a lot of sectors around the poverty line that go back and forth from poverty to non-poverty because they just earn 25 cents of a dollar more than the poverty line. But they are still very vulnerable and they are out there and they are getting nothing from the state. And so if we are talking really seriously about uh, stable democracies and, you know, we cannot have only targeted uh, programs to the poor. We need a larger a system of social protection uh, in, the, in, the, in, in, the, in the region, and we don't have that. And that explains why, in the crisis, and let me uh, uh, go to this, the volatility of consumption in Latin America is higher than volatility of, of, the G, of GDP. You know, all the impact of the crisis is bur uh, burned by the persons and the families. You know, so volatility of consumption is is very, very high. And so in the slowdown of the economic cycle, inequality and poverty grow a lot. We are very elastic to deterioration of poverty and inequality. And we, when we recover, it takes us 25 years to get to the rates bef of, of poverty we had before the crisis. And this can happen again if we don't do the right thing this time. So we convert conjunctural pro uh, poverty in Latin America into 
structural poverty because lack of protection, as I say, that have irreversible events, and Pamela referred to that, uh, uh, that have long-term consequence and permanent, permanent effects on welfare on the next generation. Mainly, maternal, maternal and infant mortality rates go up, malnutrition go up, and school and high school, high school dropouts uh, go up. Uh, let me say that today we have a, 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 a young, youngsters in Latin America between 15 and 24 years of age, 66% of them are only precariously uh, uh, included in the labor market, uh, or they, are, they don't study, and 25% of them don't study and don't work. So we lost our young people in the crisis in the last decade of the 80s because we didn't uh, take the, the right uh, policies. Okay. What will happen to unemployment? We already have some figures. They are not nice figures. If we believe that the, the region will, will grow around 1%, uh, we will lose at least 4 million jobs in 2009. At least 4 million jobs. Uh, in, in that report also, it's a report of the ILO. Uh, uh, the ILO estimates that people who are active in the labor market but earn an income below the poverty line established by the, by the World Bank, what the, the ILO calls uh, uh, work poverty, uh, will rise uh, from 6.8% in 2007 to 8.7%, almost a 2 percentage uh, points uh, in 2009, what means 7 million working poor in lack, more, more. And, that, and this that does, uh, does not include the impact on poverty due to open unemployment, the figure that I gave before that is 4 million. Okay, so reversals, huge reversals of uh, 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 poverty gains and, and the, the MDGs uh, gains are, uh, can be expected. So what, what can we do? I totally agree with uh, Pamela that uh, uh, we have to tackle, uh, we have to, to put the uh, employment guarantee schemes that go beyond conditional cash transfers in the region, and this is a must. Uh, the only, uh, and I think that infrastructure works, but especially, especially in small localities that is fast, that can be organized by the community, that have welfare effects on the community very quickly, not only mega projects. But let me just say that this has to go beyond infrastructure because women are not employed in infrastructure and I are doubly hit with unemployment in the region, the same as young, youngsters. Women and young people in Latin America have doubled the rate of unemployment of the, of the average uh, uh, population. So we have to be uh, we have to go beyond uh, beyond uh, uh, infrastructure. Conditional cash transfers, yes. We have to fine tune conditional cash transfers in order to have more flexibility to the inclusion of people hit by the crisis. For the moment, governments have been able to raise the subsidy in conditional cash transfers, but they, uh, the, the programs have shown to be very inflexible to new people that need that need the program. So they have to, flexibi to make the, uh, that flexible to, to happen. If we don't have conditional cash transfers in place, specific programs to retain children and youngsters in school and high school is a must, and health scheme for mother and children uh, should be strengthened. Uh, but let me, let me conclude my remarks uh, saying the following. You know, to be fair to the governance of the region, and the efforts they are making, because they are trying to, they are making an effort uh, of, of the right policies. Uh, but uh, small and medium-sized countries need international help. They won't make the, uh, it by themselves. The Brazil can, you know, they have the swaps, with treasury, the Mexico have other ways also because of the backing of, of the US, but not Central America, not one of them. You know, and uh, it's true that they are not lining up uh, to ask money from the IMF, but uh, there are two reasons for that. One is that, that there is a stigma, and they are afraid of the stigma of going to the IMF, and so they will have this, uh, 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 the private sector and the country get too nervous, and again, a fly of capital to the U.S., and so there, we, we need to make a more collective effort 
of funds to this region so not <clears throat> each country individually have to go to the IMF. But also, let me say that I have a, a, a heard a, a lot of presidents that are very reasonable and not irresponsible saying, I don't want to go to the IMF because I will have to cut spending. And what I need is fiscal stimulus. And so how do, is the IMF really flexible enough and is being flexible enough to take this new era and not apply the same adjust, adjustments that ask from the countries in the 80s? And that's the real question here. And uh, let me say that the, 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 the World Bank, we need not only the IMF, but we need the World Bank for the, for the fiscal uh, uh, for the fiscal support for anticyclical policies, but uh, from what I heard from Pamela, really is very small, you know. $8 billion more for the region, with only in remittances. We are uh, losing more than $3 billion, <laughs> only remittances. So, you know, uh, the, it's, it's not enough, and the regional bodies like IDB, CAF, or the, the Fund of uh, Latin American Reserves, cannot... A, a give enough help, the help that is needed. So I'm very worried that again, as I said, we behaved, we are doing what we have to do, we don't have the resources. Self-insurance is very cost, costly for a, for a country, a small country and a medium-sized country, and, still, and they will suffer with no help, real help, from the international community. Um, to finish, let me say that um, in Latin America will go through, the, I know that the next panel will, will talk about this, but Latin America will go through more than 16 elections between 2009 and 2010. The whole political spectrum can, can change. There is a sense of frustration in the political elite of the region because they feel that they will get hit and they are not receiving the unconditional, rapid help they need. And also, let me say that the uh, middle, uh, urban, middle urban classes are suffering, will suffer a lot from unemployment. And I don't know if the poor will decide the elections in Latin America, but probably a larger coalition of sectors than that. So again, uh, to focus only on the poor and not more broadly on the vulnerable may, may be a mistake. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. And that sounds like you and uh, Jorge coordinated your comments and uh, that you gave a perfect segue into his uh, presentation. I will say, Jorge, before I turn the mic over to you, that uh, after you speak, I'm going to come back to each of the panelists and give you an opportunity to make an additional comment or respond to something that perhaps one of the other panelists said, not necessarily that you disagree with, but perhaps some th a point you wanted to expand upon, or if you disagreed with something that they said, feel free to push back a little bit in terms of that as well. But Jorge, over to you, please. Thank you. Uh, I am delighted to be here, and that was, uh, both presentations really uh, uh, were a joy to listen to and to learn from. Uh, Latin America is uh, about to celebrate, um, or at least to mark, uh, not necessarily to celebrate, two anniversaries. Uh, the first is roughly the 200th anniversary of the beginning of the period of Latin American independence. Uh, and it's worth remembering because if any one of you needs technical assistance about how to destroy the next 50 years of your history, that is about what the Latin Americans set out to do beginning roughly in 1810 with a couple of exceptions. And so if you wanted to add gloom to a sense of historical perspective, Latin America really was very good at becoming underdeveloped uh, during that half century that followed independence. The anniversary I want to celebrate is approximately the 30th anniversary of what could be generally called the democratic transition. And that one, in fact, is much more hopeful. And in that context, I want to talk about uh, three topics uh, very briefly. Uh, coups, uh, the political left, and election patterns. Uh, not since 1976 has a military officer become president of a Latin American country, of, a, of Brazil or a Spanish American country, via coup staged against a constitutional president, civilian, elected in a free and fair election. And it's important to keep that perspective in mind. During the current decade, uh, even the frequency of coup attempts has declined. In the old Latin America, we would have expected during the terrible crisis, economic crisis of the 1980s, 
coup after coup in country after country. None happened. In the old Latin America, we would have expected a military coup in Argentina in 2000, a military coup in Argentina in 2001, a military coup in Argentina in 2002. None happened. In the all Latin American, the Olympic champion of presidential interruptions, Bolivia, would have had 30 coups in the last 30 years. None happened. It is different. It is different for a variety of reasons. I don't have time to go into them. For the most part, the military governed badly, and they knew it. So the supply of coups dried out. Uh, military governed badly, and the civilians knew it, so the demand for coups went down. And uh, the international environment and support for coups, with a couple of blips, also went down. It's not just in Latin America that coups became less frequent. It is worldwide that coups became less frequent. And there are exceptions. Bangladesh and Thailand are a couple of them. But it really is striking how many coups there have been worldwide and none in Brazil or Spanish America for so long. Not so bad. Now, just as bankers cannot forecast uh, that no bank will fail tomorrow, I do not want to forecast that no coup would occur, but this history is well worth remembering. This is the history of the years we have lived through, uh, and it is important not to be paralyzed uh, by memories of other times. The left. Let me just read to you uh, the names and the dates just over the last decade or so of presidential candidates who won the election and who ran on a less market-oriented platform than the incumbent whom they replaced. That is, instead of arguing what might be the left, that's, that's the definition I will give of a left. The candidate ran on a less market-oriented program than the incumbent. So it's Chavez in 98, uh, Toledo in 01, Lula in 02, Kirchner in 03, Vasquez in 04, Morales in 05, Garcia in 06, of course everybody in Ecuador. <laughs> Leave Ecuador aside, which is the exception for many things. Uh, the others give you not just a picture of the left, but a picture of wide variation in politicians, in political styles, in government programs. Or, remember, those are also the same years when Uribe was elected and re-elected, when Arena in El Salvador won again and again and again, when the PAN in Mexico won two presidential elections, or if you take uh, a legacy of the last 30 years who keeps reappearing, Daniel Ortega in Nicaragua, uh, he did not win more votes than he had won in elections before. It was that the opposition split, not unlike the Chilean election of 1970. It's very difficult for me to find a pattern of the left winning in any meaningful political sense in those cases, in those years, in those names. And when I turn to public opinion, what is it that Latin American citizens have been telling the Latino barometro pollsters year in and year out? The analysis which I am summarizing very broadly and uh, very brutally is it is almost impossible to relate a left-right ideological scale to attitudes on any issues, on trade, on investment, on abortion, on crime, call it what you will. It has amazingly little impact. This is not to say that Latin Americans do not differ on those issues, but they do not differ on a, what they themselves identify as a left-right scale. Nor does a left-right ideological scale turn out to have much impact on the voting behavior of citizens except in two countries, Bolivia and Venezuela. The easiest example, of course, is uh, Peronist in Argentina. You can be a left Peronist, you can be a right Peronist. So long as you're a Peronist, you vote Peronist. <laughs> the only issue the only issue in many Latin American countries that resembles a left-right scale that has repeatedly, during the course of the decade, had an impact 
on voting behavior is attitudes toward the Bush administration. One of the successes of the Bush administration was to intrude itself into the consciousness of Latin American voters and indeed to sort out voters in various ways. Even with regard to Bolivia and Venezuela, which I would describe as undergoing a social revolution, it is important to remember uh, that though presidents from the political left are in power in both, that the main characteristic of a social revolution is to polarize, is to polarize, is to make it impossible to discuss either Venezuela or Bolivia without having a shouting match because people raise their voices. They do it not only in Venezuela and in Bolivia, but also almost anywhere else. I do not see a political left story in Latin America. I do see it in the newspapers that write about Latin America, but not in the attitudes of citizens or the behavior of voters. So my last point is about elections. Uh, and here I will uh, just m mention main trends to any one of these five trends. There are numerous exceptions, uh, but let me give you five Latin American voting cycles since the start of the democratic transition. It is in the period that begins in, with the uh, um, 1978 victory of the opposition in the Dominican Republic and that continues in Peru and Ecuador. It is in the decade that follows that the slogan uh, coined early in the decade in Argentina would have applied best, que se vayan todos. Because the main characteristic of the first decade after the democratic transition is whoever the incumbent was or against the incumbent, whoever, whichever political party not in alliance with authoritarian rulers um, seemed closer to the, of the authoritarian ruler, vote against that party too. The symbol of that, the, probably the best symbol that makes this point, is in Peru where the person elected in 1980 as president of Peru, Fernando Valonde, was the exact same individual who had been overthrown in 1968 by the military in Peru at the start, the start of that period. Second cycle, second voting cycle, is clear by sometime in the mid-1990s. By this time, the Concertación in Chile and Arena in El Salvador had begun an impressive period of winning elections after elections, but it's not just those two. Uh, it is also Menem in Argentina. It is also Cardoso in Brazil. It is every non-Sandinista candidate uh, in this period in Nicaragua. It is Fujimori, who, yes, did have electoral support at this time in the mid-1990s. And so the pattern of either the incumbent president being reelected or the political party in power being reelected, or the political coalition in power being reelected, uh, is a very different story, very different political story from the one in the first cycle. The third cycle is around 2001, plus or minus a couple of years. Uh, incumbents are defeated. Incumbents are defeated for various reasons, but one of them is called um, uh, the Brazilian crisis in 1999, the Argentine crisis that follows, and so on. Incumbents are defeated in Argentina, in Brazil, in Peru, always in Ecuador, in Venezuela, in Colombia, in Costa Rica. And perhaps the most interesting example is that the Latin American country with the highest rate of economic growth in the end of the 90s was in the Dominican Republic. And they are the incumbent party, probably the best period uh, of a president in the history of the Dominican Republic, that political party loses as well. It was a bad time to, if you were an incumbent political party politician, to run for us. The third cycle. So the fourth cycle is the one that is coming to an end, but noteworthy during the course of this decade. Incumbents tend to win. Incumbents tend to win throughout. Not in Ecuador, but incumbents <laughs> tend to win throughout. And you find them winning not only, again, in, uh, in Chile, the Concertación, but in Colombia, on the right, in Venezuela, on the left, Argentina and Brazil, somewhere in the middle. Uh, uh, in Central America, that cycle doesn't develop very much. Central American voters 
uh, lead Latin America uh, into becoming angry first with whoever is governing them, almost regardless of what else may be happening. But in South America, the pattern of this last decade was a pattern where incumbents had a good chance of winning. Incumbents had a good chance of winning for the reasons you have heard. turned out to be that they had inherited or they had developed sound enough macroeconomic policies and they were blessed by a worldwide commodity boom. Indeed, in this decade, as in the mid-1990s, the coerced resignation of presidents, as opposed to election defeat, being chased out of uh, the presidential palace, it also declined. There is a four-year hiatus in the mid-1990s when presidents were not forced to resign by mob or by Congress. There is already four years now, don't know how long it will go, where no president has been for her, not since uh, Lucio Gutierrez in Ecuador in 1905, has a Latin American president been chased out of the presidential palace this decade. And so the question is whether we are now beginning the fifth cycle. Among the many reasons to be impressed by the political skill of Evo Morales and Hugo Chavez is to schedule your constitutional referendums now. Don't wait. Don't wait another year. If you want to amend the Constitution to try to hang on, this is the time. Hurry. <laughs> Hurry. Because what is coming is not good. So I want to end uh, by putting together the three points that I have made to you uh, in a region that has had no coups for so long, in a region that has had no coups much longer than the age of any of my undergraduates or any of my graduate students. Uh, I feel optimistic. In a region where voters, contrary what is written about them, so often, so much, including by many of my colleagues whom I greatly respect, voters are not particularly ideological. Bolivia and Venezuela to one side. They tend to try to make judgment. Sometimes they make mistakes. We all do. But it is, in fact, a very intelligent voter. Low level of information, low level of education, but not dumb. And I find that kind of voter also deserves our respect. And finally, in this period, it is true that some people who have governed well are likely to lose uh, elections that are coming up. They're likely to lose their parties, are likely to lose presidential elections, uh, or they're likely to lose congressional races. But I am heartened, and we all should be, when rulers who have governed badly, and some of them will lose too, are held accountable. Uh, we all should believe that the circulation of elites serves democracy best, and that even in countries where some have governed well for very long, it is time for somebody else to govern as well. No coups, good voters, and democracy working, not so bad, even in tough times. Well, thank you very much, and despite uh, the fact that I went to Princeton, I think maybe I'm regretting my choice. I would have liked to study under the professor here at, uh, at Harvard. That was magnificent, so thank you very much. Uh, I want to go now to a, more of a discussion format in terms of our, our panelists. So you've all put such a wealth of ideas onto the table, and frankly, this conversation could go anywhere, uh, which is kind of what I'm hoping because I think those are the most interesting conversations. But I'm going to give Arturo the first opportunity to respond. But uh, perhaps uh, to nudge you just a little bit, Arturo, along the line, you painted a fairly optimistic picture, actually, of what's happening, and I think uh, in general, we may agree with that, but I think there are also storm clouds on the horizon, and Dr. Dominguez talked about have your referendum now because it's going to get a lot worse shortly. Uh, and the fact of the matter is it may get a lot worse shortly, and if it does get a lot worse shortly, where will we be? What's the engine of recovery for the region? Well, um, what I was trying to, to, to do is, is to set the stage properly and just to include the, you know, the fact that when you think about it, the financial crisis really started about a year and a half ago. It, it was obviously uh, very seriously aggravated this past summer, but, you know, it's uh, still uh, uh, it, everybody didn't just run for the hills and uh, uh, as we witness in, in, in other occasions. Um, 
and also I don't want to minimize the, the problems uh, that, that are at work, namely the, the recessions, the, the growth slowdowns, the call them what you will. And uh, however, I try to um, not generalize within the generalization and to say that there are three basically, three groups of countries, uh, some that are very linked to the U.S. in various ways. Uh, that doesn't mean that uh, the end of the world is coming for, the, for, for them. Uh, uh, and I'm not just talking about the obvious Mexico. Mexico will survive this, of course, but even some of the smaller countries, in the, I mean, many of the smaller countries in the Caribbean and Central America will survive this with, with obviously with some social setbacks and so on. And, um, and, and so on. So there are problems at work, and I mentioned corporations. There will be corporations that will be driven to bankruptcy. There will be corporations that will have to restructure their obligations. There will be corporations that may not have the ability to pay and so on. But I think it's a different kind of uh, recession. It's a different kind of financial crisis from the ones we've seen in the past. That was the main point. Uh, and uh, in terms of uh, how long and how deep and so on, well, uh, as was said before, uh, the top priority is for the U.S. and the Europeans to get their house in order and to uh, put an end to their downward spiral so that in Latin America we can minimize and also put an end to the downward uh, spiral, mostly uh, thanks to forces beyond our control. But uh, if we can at least not make matters worse, because uh, what, what happened oftentimes in the past is that many governments uh, panicked, did the wrong thing. Um, uh, many times people panicked and did the wrong thing, uh, pulled the money out of the banks and so on. So that uh, made, made the situation much worse. So hopefully we can uh, keep our cool a little bit and, um, and keep focused and, uh, and realize that uh, we've come a long way. We've learned about mistakes in the past. Uh, the, the shoe is hurting more in, in other parts of the world. Uh, we, we have uh, better policies, better institutions, more reserves, et cetera, the, to, to cope with this. Uh, I think 2009, the social uh, temperature is going to uh, feel uh, lousy, uh, definitely. We're going to have, as in the U.S. and in Europe, we're going to have rising unemployment, and you know the, the, the sensation is going to be a bad one. But mm, I'm optimistic that uh, with all the money we're throwing at the problem uh, here and elsewhere, uh, uh, you know, that, that we will put a, a bottom to it. I think that the financial hemorrhage for the most part is done uh, and now comes the economic pain of the financial hemorrhage of, of many months ago. Uh, okay, fine, but it's not like uh, uh, we're still, you know, having to go to sleep wondering whether our, our corner bank is going to go under uh, uh, next, uh, next day. Pamela Cox talked about the, the, the opportunity in crisis and suggested that you know, 95%, I think was the statistic of, of export earnings from the region, still are dependent on, on uh, exports of uh, commodities. Do you see an opportunity in this crisis, perhaps, for the diversification that, frankly, probably everybody in this room and millions of other people have been calling for for years and years and years, but that never quite seems to occur? Or is this just another, well, we'll get through it, we'll muddle through, we'll restore growth, and then we'll continue along the commodities-driven uh, growth path that we've enjoyed for the last several years? Well, in a number of Latin American countries, indeed, we, we, we uh, bear the burden of, of being commodity rich, and that has uh, spoiled us, and that has complicated the choices, and uh, sometimes I wake up wishing we'd, we weren't so resource rich, because then, uh, um, you know, we would have to focus on, on, on other things than just milking uh, what God and nature gave us. Uh, but uh, uh, I think uh, clearly the fact that commodity prices were so high for several years in a row resuscitated the idea that, you know, maybe we don't have to work very hard. All we have to do is, 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 is uh, pump things from the ground and mine things and so on, and, and, and we're okay. So uh, may, uh, you know, hopefully now we, we can refocus on the need to uh, move on to the manufacturing stage and in particular move on to the services and high tech stage. There's no reason why Latin America cannot do that. Uh, we have a lot of smart educated people and uh, we have electric lines and phone lines and computers and so on and it's just a question of putting it to work. So in a way, as I say, the resource curse is still with us but uh, it, maybe it, it will uh, prompt a, 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 a a renewed effort to reduce dependence on commodities. Very good. And uh, Dr. Greenspan, you talked a lot about job creation and, and 
you didn't make the direct linkage, but you implied, I think, a very important uh, uh, train wreck, if I can be vernacular for a moment, about the de democra demographic changes in the region with the uh, youth uh, entering the job market at the same time that jobs are actually being lost as opposed to created. And that's a, the potential there for social imbalance, let's call it that way, a neutral term, a, as much as possible, is, is very real, very possible. Can you talk about that a little bit and for, to the extent that your, some of your work has looked at, at labor market reforms and job creation and ways to make the labor market more flexible and things that the countries could do to really help generate job creation even in a very difficult economic time? That would be very helpful, I think. And, and, and again, don't neglect the opportunity. If somebody said something that you particularly strongly disagree with, please feel, take the opportunity to respond. Okay, thank you. No, let me just say that I think that an opportunity of the crisis, just very briefly, that I have seen, the only one for the moment, is that exchange rates that they had the, the, the trend uh, to overvaluation, and that trend was reverted. And uh, because there was a correction in the exchange rates, a possibility of a more div diversified productive structure is possible. And if we take advantage of that, that, that will be a good opportunity. Uh, uh, yes, with respect to youth, yeah. Uh, uh, we have been very bad with young people in, in Latin America. We care about, you know, infants and children in school. We have neglected high schools and universities and tertiary education in, in the region. And that's because a very narrow focus in terms of inequality and redistribution, you know, because uh, usually the poor go to school but not to high school and not to tertiary education. So we finance only primary schools and, and we neglected all the rest. And in the long term, really redistributional effects are much more stronger when you get to tertiary education than if you stay only in primary school. So the whole issue now will be to revert that trend, to understand that we have to keep youngsters in school for much longer, even longer than high schools, Tertiary education has to become more important, and employment schemes very, very strong. Employment schemes. Uh, there is a there, there is a discussion. What do you do? You uh, two discussions of policy. Uh, you go for for uh, insurance, employment insurance, or you go for employment schemes. I think that we have to go for employment schemes in Latin America more than for unemployment uh, insurance schemes. Uh, the problem is that you will have to go for infrastructure uh, projects, and I, as I said, local projects too, as ma as I, uh, and also to uh, the health and education sectors that will give more opportunities to women, uh, for example, that will get uh, un unemployed. Flexibility of labor markets? Mm -mm. Now? No, I won't go for that. <laughs> you know that <laughs> uh, that's a very... Uh, strong discussion in the region, but in, in fact, uh, flexibility has me meant in Latin America not protection, but vulnerability. Uh, and I don't really think that problem in Latin America is exactly flexibility of labor markets. Uh, let me say that some economists are saying that you have to tax firing people <laughs> to, to try to keep more employment and give tax breaks for those that don't don't fire. So it's exactly the opposite of flexibility in the labor markets at this time. I don't think that that will solve the problem and will worsen the problem in this moment in, in Latin America, to say, uh, to say the least. Well, very good. Let me um, come back at you just a little bit on this and, and, and push you a little bit further. Yeah, but can I add one thing please, about young, young, young employment for the young? One of the main challenges in Latin America now is citizen security is violence, is drug, is organized crime. And we have an unlimited supply of labor of organized crime with youngsters in Latin America. You know? And if we don't stop that, I think that everything can be challenged. You know? like Central America is really suffering from what is happening in Mexico and Colombia. You know? And uh, really, you know, if you have more violence in m many of these countries than in Iraq or Afghanistan, uh, Latin America is the, the, has the highest crime rate of, of the world, you know? So I think that the, there is something there that we have to stop, and I really am worried that we won't be able to tackle this problem if we let this deteriorate even further. I, I think that's a very, very good point. And it, it, but I want to come back to this idea of, of, of job creation and the engine of job growth. And I guess, you know, I, was, I, I have the misfortune, actually, of being trained as an economist, but I only know enough to be dangerous. I'm not an expert on all of these things. So I know some questions to ask. I don't know the answers. And I guess my question is, with the, with the region, even in good times, 
even in good times, facing a difficulty in creating jobs for the demographic changes that are coming through. A commodities-based economies are not necessarily job-creating economies. They're wealth-creating economies, but perhaps you know, commodities markets um, are capital-intensive, and they're not labor-intensive, per se, um, at least once they mature and, and they're built in all these things. And the question is, how, in a, particularly in an economic crisis, I mean, I heard you say, essentially, government-mandated job creation programs. This is what I hear you saying. I don't know if that's what you meant. And I guess what I'm asking is, are there other means? Um, because labor markets in some countries, actually, it's, it's extraordinarily difficult to fire people, even, if, even for gross incompetence. Think and that, and no? so you have, well, and so you have, <laughs> you have a, a, a large number of people actually having jobs in the informal economy. And, and when they're in the informal economy, we heard a little bit about that with Pam Cox, they, they lack the protections of the state, they have no social security, they have no formal health, they have all of these things that we would take for granted because they don't have a job in the formal economy. So the question is, and I, again, I'm really struggling with this mm -hmm. myself, but how do you begin to create jobs in the formal economy in a way that doesn't bankrupt the state. How do you, how do you get that to that point? No, no, you are Your insights would be great. You, you, are, you are absolutely right, but let, let me say, it's not true that the Latin American economies don't create a, a good opportunities uh, for, uh, uh, of jobs when they are growing. And the last six years is an example. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And uh, uh, informality, yep. uh, you know, jobs were created more in the uh, uh, salary a part than in the informal sector and self-employed in Latin America in these last five years than, than before. And so informality is a problem, but I, I would divide the problem in two. One is the informality that is because you don't, you don't attend the law. You don't, have, you don't pay social security, you don't pay health, but it's a high productivity job. And the other is the low productivity sectors that have informality. That is a problem of investment and low productivity, not a problem of uh, you know, uh, the, the em employment tax ex schemes for social security. Mm -hmm. I would worry about the second, and I would tackle the, the first in a, in a very different uh, way. Uh, and I think that the problem he's, here is the rate of investment. You know, one of the big differences between Latin America and the Asian countries that we didn't uh, really recover <laughs> uh, or, uh, or, or did very well, even in the last 10 years, is the rate of investment. We have very low rates of investment and low rates of savings. Now we don't want to, you know, to increase the rates of savings precisely now. Now it's not, we won't be the best. But the, the truth is that the rate of investment and the investment in technology and, and the high, high quality human uh, capital, not only the basic, is, is the way to go forward. And I think that we can, we can do it and there are countries that are leading the way. In terms of employment schemes, I agree with you that I think that will have to be employment schemes with the intervention of the, of the private sector. And that is possible. There are a lot of examples in the world and uh, good examples that we, we, we can have. And scaling up employment schemes uh, with the, uh, with the uh, partnership of the private sector is totally possible and is a way to go. Very good. Well, thank you. Now, those are very insightful comments. I appreciate you indulging my uh, direction down into labor markets. But uh, now, Jorge, you've, uh, you actually raised the question, but I don't think you actually did answer it. You, you took us up to the... Uh, he took us up to Mount Sinai and we looked at the promised land here and we didn't go into Sinai and uh, we didn't go into the promised land about what is going to happen in this next round of elections. And uh, obviously... Incumbents lose. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's, except I, in Ecuador. I, I, I mean, there is sort of a, there is a, a quasi-experiment, if you will, looking forward. Uh, who will get blamed? Um, will <coughs> neoliberal economics be blamed? in which case um, the Kirchners will do very well in Argentina in the midterm elections coming up. I don't think that's likely. Uh, the other side is incumbents will get blamed, even if they have governed well. Uh, and so, but, but we will, by the end of this uh, marathon of elections that is coming up, uh, be able to make a judgment as to whether voters will hold rulers ideologically accountable or just simply hold rulers accountable. Do you, an, do you anticipate that? But, but my guess is that incumbents will lose, the good ones and the bad ones. And, and does that, 
rely in any particular way on the depth of the economic crisis in the region. For example, if things deteriorate further um, and economic conditions deteriorate and the middle class, we've talked a little bit about the middle class, right. I think that's a key point, gets squeezed more and more. Right. I mean, uh, the, uh, in Central America, you have, al even before these bad times, you already are coming into the crisis with the grumpy voters. Correct. And so it would, it would it frankly will surprise me if the outcome in the Salvadoran presidential election is very different from the outcome in the Salvadoran legislative election. It may happen, but I, I mean, I, it, this may be uh, the end of a long period of rule by one very impressive political party. Whatever one's political preferences may be, as a political party, amazingly impressive. Uh, same about the Concertación in Chile. Whatever one's use may be, an amazingly impressive political coalition. It may also be defeated by the end of the year. Um, the depth of the economic crisis will make this hunch that incumbents will lose much more likely. But voters, and this is why I had wanted to mention, uh, there are circumstances when the economy begins to weaken even by a bit which is what happened in the Dominican Republic at the end of the first term of Leonel Fernandez, and even a weakening by a bit in what had been a very good period of four years in the presidency meant the incumbent political party got trashed. So often a small marginal shift uh, is enough to defeat um, a, uh, an incumbent party. Well, very good. I would love to monopolize this conversation because I would love to pursue a number of these themes, but uh, I promise to allow the conversation to be opened up to the audience. And before I go to Paulo, uh, please, uh, we've got a couple microphones, and uh, we're going to go down here first. So when the microphone hits you, is there a microphone? It's, oh, there it is. Right there. Uh, identify yourself, please, by name and organization. Max, we're going to go here to Paulo, the front row. Um, and uh, I'm going to let this panel go for a few minutes beyond, because we got started a couple minutes late, probably thanks to me in the first place. But uh, anyway, I take advantage of some true expertise up here. So let's go for probably another 20 minutes or so. Um, so formulate your questions now. Paulo, please. Yes, I'm Paulo Sotero with the Brazil Institute here at the center. Uh, on your last question or answer, uh, I would like to push a little bit on this. Being from Brazil, we know that regardless of the outcome of next presidential election. We don't know if President Lula, that right now, at the sixth, seventh year of his administration, has a popularity rate of 82% approval. Uh, it, he may not be able to elect his successor for reasons having to do with the economic crisis or for the lack of experience of that, uh, that candidate, etc. It, it could be, for instance, that the governor of Sao Paulo, José Serra, leading now in the polls, uh, will, uh, be, uh, will triumph uh, on his, what would be this, his second effort to be president. Uh, most informed people in Brazil believe that there won't be much of a dramatic change in the direction of policy in Brazil. Uh, I would venture to, and that's why I would like you to, sure. or any of you to guess a little bit, Chile probably the same uh, if the opposition wins. <laughs> so uh, if you go there, because uh, I am always, you know, when people say, well, there will be all those elections in Latin America, well, that's precisely part of the plan. This is precisely what we fought for 20 and 30 years ago, is to have them constantly. The more the merrier. <laughs> and uh, so I would like you uh, to, to, to try to push on this a little bit. It reminded that, you know, uh, a change is good, as uh, in some major countries uh, have recently experienced in the Americas. <laughs> Very good. Actually, uh, let's just take this question on its own. Uh, and let's give each of the panelists a chance to discuss Brazil for just a moment from your perspective. I, I ended my policy. remarks by yeah. celebrating uh, the circulation of elites, uh, that precisely that what we value is democratic politics. Uh, some countries are fortunate, you mentioned two of them, uh, that whether the government of the party or the opposition party wins, chances are there would be 
uh, uh, good governance. There will, there's a range and there will be policy differences. Uh, but I, if I were a citizen of either Brazil or Chile, the two examples that you indicated would not be particularly alarmed. Uh, in other cases, yeah, I would be. Uh, but still, there is this value, uh, and it is important not only to respect the will of the voters, but to realize that for the most part, uh, voters have been choosing well. Uh, and I'm prepared to go with that bet looking, looking ahead. Dr. Greenspan, any comments on Brazil? No? Arturo? No. no? Okay. <clears throat> all right. We said all that we could say about Brazil, Paulo. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I saw it with Sidney Weintraub next, so let's go over here. There's a microphone here, and then we'll go back to, uh, to Ed, sure. Sidney yeah. right. yep. Weintraub, Center for Strategic and International Studies. Uh, Rebecca, I just want to check some facts that you gave. You talked a little on two areas, one about uh, education, primary, secondary, and university, and then about uh, informal labor. Let me, let me give you some impressions I have, and correct me because I'm not sure. I, have, I don't know all of the countries as well as you two. Uh, but I have some experience, actually, when I was a mission director in Chile many, many years ago. I tried to get them to put a lot more money in the uh, uh, primary and secondary schools because they were putting tremendous amounts in the universities. The people who passed the exams to get into the universities, most of them went to private schools, and they then went into free universities. In other words, Mexico does the same thing now essentially. In a sense, they were, they were subsidizing the wealthy kids precisely because they were putting too much into the universities and not enough into the primary and secondary. I don't know if that's general. Anyhow, that's one question. The second one is similar. You talked about the informal economy or you, or the desirability, if you want to call it, inamobilidad, keeping people in jobs. But there's a response to that on the part of the corporations, they don't hire them. Right. Or they hire them part-time. Or they hire them in a way that they force them to be informal. The, Me the country I know best is Mexico, and it's about half and half uh, informal, formal. Uh, and that's the response, and I guess that most of the economists in Mexico think exactly the reverse of what you said. The thing they've got to do is figure out a way to get rid of the informality, and the only way they can think of is to have modifications on all of the costs of keeping people on beyond their useful time. Have I got it wrong, or do you have it wrong? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's a big discussion. <laughs> but, Please. You know, well, uh, first of all, good that you uh, brought Chile and Mexico with respect to the tertiary education. I am not saying only universities, but tertiary education that is much broader than that. But precisely, we just finished two very good papers on distributional effect of higher education. And we did a long series, for example, in, in Chile, in terms how a distribution of income a, a, a followed. A, and, a, trying to differentiate short-term effects of redistribution uh, aspects, like going only for primary school, from long-term effects. And uh, we find that in Chile, one of the main uh, uh, reasons for income distribution getting better, or uh, the Gini coefficient going down in the last years, was precisely a massive uh, entrance of uh, people to tertiary education in the uh, time of the uh, concertation uh, period. And uh, you can see in the, in the period of uh, dictatorship, and we call that dictatorships don't like universities, uh, that really that was not happening at all. You know, it was very, very suppressed, the entrance of large numbers of people to tertiary education. So here there is a dilemma, and I agree that there is a dilemma. The, the thing is how we deal with it, because we, we have to know both facts. It's true that today, you know, poor people don't go to tertiary education. 
But it's also true that if you don't build tertiary education, they will never get there because it will be of very bad quality, like happened with secondary schooling and high school because we didn't pay any attention to, uh, to high school in the 80s. Let me say that Costa Rica, and I know that for a fact, because Costa Rica was the first country that received a loan from the World Bank in the uh, mid-90s for secondary education. Loans for secondary education were off the table for a long time. And we have the problem of quality education that was referred to by Pamela, uh, because we, you don't build you, by decree, you know, not high schools and not tertiary education. You have to build them through time. So how do you build them, you know, to, it, with today's numbers or with, with you know, a project for future numbers. And so the problem really is to get vulnerable groups, poor people, into tertiary education, but not slash tertiary education, because if not, you cannot have a proper public sector that will provide the service. And the problem of Latin America is that if the public sector is not there at all, you have totally segmented a, a quality services for poor people and for, for rich people. And that's, you know, rich people will go to private schools, also in tertiary education. But do we want that to happen to everybody? Can poor people go to, you know, how do you deal with the dilemma? But there is a dilemma, I agree. But you have to choose, you know, if you choose the long term or the short term, you know, the, 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 the country has to choose. But it's not obvious for me that you don't have to give public money to tertiary education, not obvious. Okay. Uh, uh, informal, uh, and the same, we have the same for Mexico, by the way, than for Chile. So the two examples that you gave have very interesting numbers there. Uh, inform, informality and inamobility. I totally agree with you that inamobility is not, it cannot be, you know? But is total flexibility really the answer for the labor markets? Uh, we don't have evidence, really strong, evidence-based data to say that. We don't have it. Uh, and uh, the, the truth is that countries that have some regulation of labor markets and have tax payrolls for health and for pension and, you know, on uh, pay payroll uh, uh, contributions, like Costa Rica, has a better performing labor market that you say Mexico. It's true that they have a lot of regulation, but not, nobody obeys. You know, the, the sector that obeys is very small. So I, don't, I, I am not really sure that the problem in Mexico is lack of mobility. It, there is a lot of mobility, a lot of mobility in the labor market. It's not in a mobility the problem of, of Mexico. It's a, a different problem. So I challenge a little bit how evidence-based is that, uh, that statement. I, I think that there is something we, we should continue uh, discussing, but I think that we have to go beyond like recipes and go really to the evidence to see how labor markets are functioning in each country, and probably the answer will be different for, for different countries, you know, depending on the structure of, 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 the, labor, of the labor sector. I sense a research project coming on. <laughs> uh, I promised Ed Schumacher, please. Uh, Edward schumacher Matos from the Rockefeller Center. I'd like to pick up on what uh, Jorge was, was saying and, and, and ask you to think about another way of looking at the future uh, and the period of the last 10 years, and it's going back to the conditional cash transfers. And if we have some 90 million people receiving conditional cash transfers throughout Latin America, and they're coming from governments on the right and the left, and those governments are being... Um, re-elected uh, and a great demand for them to stay in office, um, I wonder if that might perpetuate itself going forward and that what we're really seeing is that we're buying the vote of the poor. This is not to say we shouldn't be helping the poor, but that's uh, an unintended consequence that may be coming out of that. Hmm. Who wants to get that? Who wants to take that one? Well, uh, the, uh, no, it, he, he uh, it asked me, and, uh, and, it's a, and it's a very good question. Um, under the rubric of conditional cash transfers, many things happen. Uh, in some uh, of these programs, uh, the, the, what I know, and some of it comes really from community studies, some of it comes from larger studies, I am impressed that they seem to be what they're designed to be. 
that they're not vote-buying strategies, uh, that they really are designed in ways to try to ensure uh, that participants meet uh, designated criteria. One of those uh, uh, countries where I've seen a fair amount of this work is Mexico. What also happens in Mexico is that people who receive these cash transfers are choosing to vote disproportionately for the incumbent party. Uh, and that makes sense because politicians who do good things should be rewarded. That's a different reasoning mechanism. It's a different form of behavior from vote buying. Uh, the vote buying, which you've also studied in this sense in Mexico, has gone down, hasn't disappeared, has gone down dramatically. And its effectiveness, uh, even where it exists, has also gone down dramatically. But on that question, uh, just to elaborate further, because I think uh, it's a very important uh, topic, one of the concerns in thinking about the recent years uh, where these policies of various types have become very popular uh, is that it coincided with a period of economic growth. One way to think about economic growth is that it is the best anti-poverty program. When you have a period of economic growth coinciding with these social policies, it is somewhat difficult to disentangle whether poverty reduction occurred because of economic growth, because of social policy, or some interaction. Part of where we're going into uh, is it will now be the opportunity to examine under very harsh circumstances whether these social policies can in fact be countercyclical and operate when there's no money. And this we don't know. You now just witness a historical moment, a Harvard professor who says he doesn't know. <laughs> <laughs> we need more of those. Yeah. <laughs> All right, we're coming up very close to time, so we're going to do one lightning round of questions. What that means is I'm going to take about three or four questions. I am going to ask each of you not to make any statements, any comments, or any predictions. I simply want a question, all right, because that's all we've got. Uh, so we're going to take about three or four of these. We're going to start with Inez Bustillo with ECLAC. Uh, if you have the question to direct to a specific person, and then I saw, I think, uh, Margaret Daly Hayes, and the question right here, we'll probably keep the microphone right in this little group here so we can get going. So Inez, please raise your hand so we can get the microphone. Um, and uh, we'll wrap this up. And then as the panelists uh, make your uh, brief uh, responses to the questions, if you have any final thoughts, now's your time to get it because it will be the last opportunity to speak. So thank you. Yes, I have a question that relates to what uh, Rebecca said at the end of her first intervention. You ended up by saying that at the end of the game, the impact of the global financial crisis on, on many of the Latin American and Caribbean countries will depend on the real financial help and response of the international community. And in fact, that's the case. Countries throughout the region are undertaking vast measures. We just, we're very mon monitoring them very closely. But at the end of the game, it will depend for many of them with this financial response. Now, any suggestions? What would the panelists uh, say in terms of what type of financial response can realistically be uh, asked for or try to move uh, forward in the months to come? Very good. Pass it right behind you, please, to uh, Margaret Daly Hayes, who has that evidence-based research that Rebecca Greenspan is looking for. So. You took the words right out of my mouth. Thank <laughs> you. <Very good. laughs> As we look to the future and growth returns, um, we know that, as Eric said, commodities aren't going to generate the kind of labor uh, demand that is required. And therefore, and by the same token, the private sector in Latin America is characterized as not being very competitive in the global marketplace. Um, but the man for labor has to come from the private sector. Uh, are there among the schemes, uh, we've seen some private sector companies begin training personnel uh, themselves in Brazil, Mexico, elsewhere. Among the schemes that you see, Rebecca, and, and others as well, um, are there ways to mobilize the entrepreneurial uh, element of the private sector more effectively in order to create jobs, in order to create training opportunities? And as you think about tertiary education, what do you mean different from university education? Thanks. And we'll put it right next. There you go. And we'll take this as the last question, please. Joan Nelson, uh, Wilson Center and American University. Um, again, reacting to one of the things that Rebecca said, 
uh, but I think it may be a broader question. Uh, clearly a tension, in Latin America and for that matter in the United States, uh, between uh, addressing, buffering the most vulnerable groups in the current downturn and doing something to, for middle strata that are also suffering and are politically probably a good deal more potent. I've long been an advocate in the longer term of the importance of addressing uh, middle strata as well as tight targeting for uh, poorer groups. But I do see a bit of a train wreck uh, in the crisis context. And so I guess the question would be, what are uh, two or three key things that one could do for middle strata that don't uh, completely drain uh, very limited fiscal resources for more targeted, uh, poor-oriented programs? Keeping in mind also Pamela Cox's remarks about the importance of targeting. Very good. We've got uh, a grand total of about three or four minutes, so uh, we're going to take these as fast as we can. But we've got the international response to the crisis, uh, how to generate entrepreneurialism uh, from the private sector, and what can be done for the middle strata. Let's start here with Arturo. Uh, I'm, you can choose any or all these questions uh, or take a different route for a wrap-up <coughs> comment, and then we'll close. No, fine. I'll just uh, tackle the first one. I mean, I, I think it's great that we have international financial institutions with uh, ammunition, uh, financial ammunition, to, to intervene and help in this situation. In particular, of course, the IMF, because uh, virtually all Latin American governments have repaid uh, their obligations to the IMF, so they have substantial borrowing rights under even uh, normal uh, programs, never mind the, the, the supersized uh, uh, programs that the IMF uh, sometimes uh, uh, provides. Uh, so I think that's great. Uh, the uh, IFIs are there, and the bilateral agencies also. I hope that under the Obama administration, uh, uh, AID and, and Exim Bank and others will uh, get additional ammunition so that they can uh, help to take care of the weakest elements, uh, so, uh, assuming that governments want their want their help. Uh, but. Uh, I just want to reemphasize that the good news about Latin America is that most governments have made a lot of progress in recent years. They have strengthened their central banks. They have sent, uh, strengthened their budgeting process. They have uh, refocused their social spending. They have uh, 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 paid down uh, foreign debt, in particular uh, the more expensive kind, the more short-term kind. They have developed domestic capital markets. They have. Uh, invited in uh, foreign investment in the banking system as well as in others. Uh, and uh, they have uh, adopted more flexible exchange regimes, et cetera, et cetera. And I think all these elements will pay off. And it will become very clear that those few governments that uh, turn the clock back in these areas or uh, never embarked in uh, serious uh, constructive reforms uh, they're going to run out of money, and they're going to stew in their own sauce. <laughs> Dr. They, <deserve> <laughs> they definitely deserve it. <laughs> Dr. Greenspan, please. <laughs> Let me uh, uh, first uh, the entrepreneurial uh, question. You know, there are good examples of some successes in Latin America. Chile, Chile had a very interesting, you know, entrepreneurial. A program for, for new exports that was intended to lower the risk of the entrepreneur and allowing for the creativity and, you know, and the, cre and, and the credit access for, for the person was very well monitored. It was very successful. So there is this incubadoras, how do you say? In incubators. In incubators? Yeah. <laughs> Wasn't Not too bad. far away. <laughs> uh, incubators that are doing very well, you know, in, in some of the Latin American countries, and there is some experiences that are very, and I, I totally agree with you that probably this going back to some entrepreneurship type of uh, uh, policies and, and instruments is, uh, can be very important in, in the region. But I think that the, one of the 
you know, when, when you have a commodity boom for, for so long, like the last five years, it's very difficult to have the incentives to diversify your, your, your structure because you have to fight against the overvaluation of your currency so, so heavily, you know, that sometimes you, really the central banks cannot intervene so much to be able to, to stop the trend. So maybe now this will be an opportunity to go back to a more to policies for a much more diversified uh, uh, productive structure. Tertiary education, for example, not only universities, for example, Colombia has a very successful uh, training program of technical training after high school. You know, it, it's not a university degree, it's something intermediary, but it's given a lot of uh, 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 opportunities to, to young people through the program. So the only way is not universities, but something more than only secondary schooling. Uh, according to CEPAL, uh, in Latin America, you, you need at least 12 years of education to go beyond the probability of being poor. You know, so if we stop at secondary education, even even uh, high school, uh, w won't be enough, and uh, it's, it's a big challenge because only 50% of of, uh, of uh, youngs uh, finish high school in in Latin America. Only 50%. Uh, it's true what you say. You know, you, you you always have this problem of what to do. You know, do you go for the poorest that are suffering the most, and I will put most of my money there. I won't go for general subsidies, and I, in that I will agree with Pamela, in terms of gasoline that I've seen, and I think that that's a waste. But employment schemes that are targeted, are targeted, can be well designed, can help the most vulnerable that are not poor, but very similar to the poor, <laughs> you know, that are also in the urban areas and that have no, no chance to go, to go away and will be a very, well, a, a very good spend money in terms of a stimulus package if, if, you, if it's well designed. So it's true that I won't go for general subsidies, and I think that Pamela was right on that. But you can go beyond only cash transfers as, as the only uh, policy that uh, you need to, to counteract the, the and I, I, think, I thank Ines because I totally agree with you. I don't have the answer like the Harvard professor. But, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I think that there, there has to be more voice in, in Washington. And I say this, you know, I have talked to some of the think tanks. I think that there has to be a monitoring on the IFIS in terms of their behavior with small and middle income countries because I'm not sure they are getting the amount of resources they need to really go through this crisis with, without a great a, a, a social cost. And if we don't invest it now, as I say, we pay for decades, you know, the, the effects of, of the crisis. Uh, let me just mention a couple of things on the international response, uh, picking up on some of the discussion when uh, Pamela Cox was speaking. Latin America has a very high stake in an open international trading regime. Latin America really does benefit from international trade. One of the reasons to worry about the quote-unquote, buy American provisions in the stimulus package. Uh, it's the last thing that we need now is a contemporary version of the Holy uh, Smoot Tariff of 1930. Uh, Latin America really will benefit enormously uh, if there is a worldwide trade negotiations that reduce the agricultural subsidies on agricultural output in the industrial countries. Uh, this is precisely the sort of thing uh, uh, that would benefit the region enormously. And that is an aspect of the international response that will not happen if the Latin Americans decide that, oh, well, trade is not good for us. That would be genuinely stupid behavior. The second aspect, and the only other one that I, I'll mention, there are other things what I could say, I wanted to pick up on something that Rebecca quite rightly mentioned uh, in an earlier moment in her remarks. Crime. Uh, the United States, a bit over a decade ago, uh, adopted the uh, Transnational Crime Enhancement Act. Uh, now, probably you don't know any act that actually has that name, but you are familiar with the kind of process that does it. There is a little campesino raised somewhere uh, in um, 
near Bani in the Dominican Republic or raised somewhere uh, in the outskirts of San Salvador or raised somewhere in Jalisco, comes to the United States, um, uh, picks up a bit of English, learns how to handle assault weapons, uh, is picked up, uh, manages to develop uh, all the techniques of gang warfare, and is then sent back courtesy of a U.S. taxpayer to the Dominican Republic or to Jalisco or to, or to El Salvador to become part now of a high-tech transnational criminal. The U.S. needs to pay more attention to its policies inside prisons. The United States needs to uh, pay much more attention to the ease of gun smuggling across the U.S.-Mexican border. The United States needs to realize that it should not be the cause of transnational criminal enhancement, as it so often has been. That, too is part of the international response. Very good. Well, those are two terrific comments that uh, I think is probably an excellent way to end. I would love to continue this conversation because I think it's been so rich, but uh, we can't. We're at time. We're beyond time. Uh, but I want to thank all of you for your participation. I want to uh, thank you for your presence here. We've got a short break, but before we go there, would you please join me in thanking all the panelists for their terrific comments. <laughs>